If you truly want to become wealthy, then listen up. The Millionaire Next Door is a longtime best-selling book written by two PhDs who spent decades researching the behavior of thousands of millionaires. Their work reveals that there is indeed a scientifically derived approach to financial success. If you have the commitment and discipline to follow it through, your odds of enjoying financial abundance as well as true quality of life are very high. So what are these key success factors for building wealth and how do they apply today? Dr. William Denko, the book's surviving co-author, sits down with us to generously share the key insights from his rigorous research. You know, validity means truth, right? And when we have the convergence of various sources of truth, we had IRS data, we had Census Bureau data, we had paper and pencil questionnaires, we had focus groups, we had all of these various data sets that all converged on the basic truths that we wrote about in the book. Today, we have the great fortune of speaking to one of the world's top experts on wealth, specifically, which behaviors are most successful at accumulating it. Dr. William Danko, along with fellow PhD Thomas Stanley, co-authored the book, The Millionaire Next Door, The Surprising Secrets of America's Wealthy, back in 1996. The book was based on their decades of research, surveying and interviewing thousands of high net worth and high income individuals. It quickly became a bestseller and has sold over 4 million copies to date. After the passing of Dr. Stanley, Dr. Danko published a follow-on book with Dr. Richard Van Ness in 2017 titled Richer Than a Millionaire, A Pathway to True Prosperity. Its lessons focus on how to achieve true wealth in life, more meaningful than just the numbers in your bank account. Today, we'll dive into his top advice to all of us hoping, or, hoping to be wealthier tomorrow than we are today. Bill, it's an honor as well as a personal delight to welcome you to the program. Thanks so much for coming on. I am delighted to be here, Adam. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Well, in, uh, in just a second, I want to dive into why you wrote these books, Bill, but I'm looking at your background here. Um, I see there's a fish there above you. And I think there's a little story behind that. What's going on with that fish there? Uh, that 24 inch rainbow trout. I caught that when I was on a fishing trip with Tom Stanley in the early 1980s. We were doing some, uh, you know, conceptualization of the product that we uh, that became the millionaire next door. But um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm proud of that fish. It's the biggest fish I ever caught. It was up in the Adirondack Mountains. And uh, it's, a, it's a keeper. That's for sure. <laughs> well, it looks like you did indeed keep it, and it looks like it led to bigger and better things with your collaboration with Dr. Stanley there. So, yes. um, Bill, I'm so excited for this interview um, because there are so many people whose lives were heavily influenced by your work back uh, in uh, The Millionaire Next Door, uh, and I'm one of them. I've actually got my, my copy right here, which I just checked. It is a first edition paperback version of it. I think I even have a first edition hardcover around here somewhere. Um, Hardcover. <laughs> there you go. There it is right there. So um, uh, for, well, for those watching who have read the book and for those for whom this book might be new to, um, can you just tell us why did you decide uh, to write that book and, and then later on your follow on book, which again is about uh, true wealth and, and prospering? Mm -hmm. what, what was the driving inspiration here? Yeah, like so many things in life, uh, luck <laughs> plays a large part of it. You know, when I was an undergraduate student, Tom Stanley was one of my professors and he taught a consumer behavior course and I thought it was fascinating. He was a young, untenured assistant professor. I was a, a mere undergraduate, but I got an A in his course. I really liked the way he taught his thinking and he invited me to participate in 1973 in his very first study of the affluent market. So really, when you talk about the roots of rock and roll, 1973, an untenured professor trying to get a research agenda going, I was a willing student, and it was a wonderful mentoring relationship, that's for sure. So shortly after that, he went on to another school, and but he said, you know, Bill, you really have to go get a PhD. And... Uh, 
a couple of other people said that too because uh, uh, I took it seriously. I said, well, what the heck? Went into a PhD program at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI for short, at the Lally School of Management. And um, so during that time of getting the PhD, getting married, having three kids, and trying to build my own career at a university myself, Tom and I had done a number of studies from 1973 right through 1993 when he called me up with a really exciting idea. He said, let's get back together and do a book called Big Hat, No Cattle. And I said, well, geez, you know, <laughs> what's this all about? You know, again, I'm a, a young professor myself with family obligations, and he wants to go off on another um, escapade which turned out to be a huge success, of course, with uh, the millionaire next door. But the idea was there are people who look like they have wealth, but really have nothing. They have wall-to-wall -wall debt. And that's where the big hat, no cattle comes in. You know, you look good, but you have no substance. You're on an economic treadmill. And as long as you keep working, you can maintain that lifestyle. Well, those with real financial net worth have this ability to do things on their own terms when and if they want to do it, right? They can choose their own career path. They can choose to how to spend their time. That's what it really comes down to. It gives them freedom to act in a way that they want to act instead of having the golden handcuffs of having a salary and saying, I have to work in order to maintain a lifestyle. I'm not saying there's not any work involved. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that the net worth allows you to create a lifestyle on your own terms. So really it was 20 years of research where we had this overnight success <laughs> from 1993 when we in earnest did some more survey research then published in 1996. And in fact, the first print run was 5,000 copies. It immediately sold out. And as you said, 4 million copies later, uh, all I can say is God bless America. <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> well, international it, too. International. International. Well, well, because the tenants here aren't specific to any particular country, right? I mean, they're universal ways for building wealth, correct? Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I'm of Polish extraction, and I did presentations in Warsaw a couple of years ago, but both books, The Millionaire Next Door and Richer Than a Millionaire, are both in Polish. And on top of that, they're, The uh, Millionaire Next Door is in Lithuanian as well. I mean, but it's also in Spanish and Japanese and simplified Chinese. There's all sorts of, you know, uh, versions of it. But uh, yeah, it's an international bestseller. It's as simply as that. It's an international bestseller. All right. Well, I, I want I want to get into its tenants soon. But but before we do, um, uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about the book is that uh, the insights within it are empirically derived. Um, you do primary interview, uh, statistically significant surveys. Um, and other kinds of tried and true uh, social science research protocols and in, in putting together all the data. Um, mm -hmm. Most other popular books on wealth building really just come down to one person's, uh, you know, they've, they've got a claim that says, hey, look, I've got this special framework, follow it and you're gonna get rich. Um, it's really more of a philosophy where yours is much more uh, statistically based where it just says, look, we talk to the people who have been successful in, in building wealth mm -hmm. and these are the elements that are you know, the most highly correlated with their success. Um, now, uh, did you guys know going in when you wrote the, the first copy of the book that um, you were bringing in a highly differentiated approach here? Or did you just kind of stumble into it given your academic background? Well, I, I wouldn't say stumble, but it, here, here's the thing. And any kind of research project, I mean, for example, I have an article that I'm very proud of with one of my other colleagues at the university um, in the consumer behavior area that took us 12 revisions 
and over a year to get it published. And it's only 20 pages long, but it's all based on solid research procedures. It's our interviews, it's our hypothesis development, it's our data collection, it's our interpretation. And so what I'm suggesting is that this is the same kind of mentality that is needed to create, um, well, the millionaire next door in this particular case. We had what is called convergent validity. You know, validity means truth, right? And when we have the convergence of various sources of truth, we had IRS data, we had Census Bureau data, we had paper and pencil questionnaires, we had focus groups, we had all of these various data sets that all converged on the basic truths that we wrote about in the book. Yeah, you know, it's so hard to, to replicate something like that because it took 20 years, <laughs> 20 years of research to, to come up with the, the, the final idea of this is where it's all leading. So yeah, it, it is different than most other books because it has that substantial research background. And, you know, look, any kind of research is painful. It really is. Um, I, I think about my dissertation advisor uh, who told me, he goes, Bill, I really hate to write, but I really like the final product. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> That's a good way I get to say it. it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of missteps and misfires until you get it right. Well, well that, that's really the reason why I uh, am so emphatic in recommending this book to people, because it is not opinion. It's not necessarily a trendy uh, way of looking at the world that, that might be supplanted by the next trend that comes out in the next five or 10 years. Um, it, it really is data. And to refute it, someone's going to have to come back with, with different data that, that is more convincing than this. But. It, it, exactly. That's what, you know, what, when I deal with my critics and I say, well, look, do your own study yeah. <laughs> and, and let's compare, you know, <laughs> and that'll, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Yeah. I'll, I'll bet that shuts a lot of mouths. Yeah. It really um, does. So look, uh, you know, as I mentioned, so many people were so excited when I, I told them that you were coming on the program uh, because of, of what an impact the insights of the book had on them. Um, Let's start with The Millionaire Next Door. We'll then get to your newer book. Um, but for the folks that haven't read uh, The Millionaire Next Door, um, you know, first, a, a quick little bit of backstory or background to it. One, um, it was written back in the 90s when a million dollars uh, went a lot farther uh, than it, it did today. Um, and I, I probably want to ask you about that maybe later on in the conversation, if any of this has changed based upon uh, the, you know, the, the devaluation that we've seen in, in, in the dollar. But, but anyways, uh, before we get that wonky, um, uh, but, but some of the key kind of revelations of the book were that um, it, 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 it sort of broke a lot of conventional assumptions, right? People thought of the traditional millionaire as the trust funder who, you know, drank champagne and caviar for breakfast and drove a Rolls Royce. And uh, your research really revealed that, that no, in fact, the, the you know, majority of uh, millionaires were self-made folks who lived a decidedly frugal, um, one might even say sort of blue collar lifestyle uh, and uh, really you know, defied the conventional uh, uh, images of excess. So um, uh, you talk in the book about people who become what you refer to as prodigious accumulators of wealth. And uh, if you could, could you just quickly summarize what, what, what are the key findings from the book? If somebody wants to become uh, you know, as wealthy as, as, as the millionaire class, what are the behaviors that those people, what, what behaviors are most likely going to get them there? Yeah. You know, one of the problems we have in America and Western society in general is how pervasive advertising can be and how influential it can be. And you look at all these beautiful people, you know, in beer commercials or car commercials and say, my gosh, I want to aspire to be like that. I want to buy what they're buying. One of the things that we know based on the empirical evidence is that for every wealthy person who can actually afford one of those luxury items, the car, the house, the whatever, there are four to five non-millionaires or non-wealthy people buying the same product because they want to look like a millionaire. <laughs> See, and, and this is really critical. So th th there is a group of people who can really afford to buy their helicopters and private planes and everything else. You know, I have a number of friends who can do that and do do that. And they are truly mega millionaires. I don't know any billionaires yet personally, but people with, you know, 20, $50 million net worth can live that kind of lifestyle, no question. But when you realize 
and, and, and look at the, what is the median net worth in America today? It's about $120,000 per household, 120,000. That's you know, current data. To be a one percenter, $11 million net worth will get you there. That's the lower end of the threshold to, to get into the one percent category. And so when you have, you know, say $2 million, you're in the 95th percentile, you're in the top 5%. So when you, when you say, well, a million doesn't go as far as it, it used to, well, then this is true. It's, it's, it's absolutely true. But we still have people stuck in this mindset that they're going to spend their way to wealth, <laughs> you know? And, and of course, that's the, the, the number one problem that's preventing them from becoming wealthy. You know, they want to create a lifestyle because they want to emulate others in their neighborhood. Right, and Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt because you're taking it exactly where I want you to go. But um, one thing that is different today versus when you wrote the book has been the, the explosion of social media. Um, is social media and the whole influencer lifestyle, is that making this problem even worse? Oh, absolutely. You know, I recently quit Facebook because I saw all my beautiful friends always doing wonderful things. I said, wait a minute, that's not life. You know, everything is edited. <laughs> so I do LinkedIn and that's good. But, but when we see this, um, this, it really is pervasive. Look, I was a marketing professor for 31 years and I taught students how to extract money from customers. And this is the hot buttons you have to push in order to make them feel that this product is going to make them feel better. You know, um, I, I don't want to say this is a confession of saying I, I wasted 31 years doing things like that, but truly marketing is a powerful tool and you can create expectations in the marketplace and people say, I want to be like that. Well, the millionaire next door says, wait a minute, I want to create a plumbing business. I want to create a whole series of rental units, especially things like uh, storage units, you know, so you don't have this eviction problem <laughs> that, that we currently have. And I, I have some friends in the real estate business who are getting burned right now because uh, rents aren't being paid and the government says you don't have to pay them. Okay. So th there are things that are, in fact, one of the appendices in the millionaire next door, I think it's appendix three, we have a litany of about 150 job uh, titles uh, of people who, you know, have become very wealthy and they include things like, um, you know, well, landlords, but one of my favorites is um, a bovine semen distributor. <laughs> and I've actually met four of them in my travels and various uh, lectures, but think about this. They have a very specialized skill in a very organic business and they get paid nicely for what they do in propagating the next uh, you know, herd of uh, cattle. And one of the problems we have though, is that could you imagine the parents who are very successful in such a blue collar, rough and tumble, but lucrative occupation one of the things they're going to do is sit their daughter down at the breakfast table and say, my dear, I want you to go to a private school and hang out with kids who spend a lot of money. Now, they don't say that explicitly, but they're saying, I want something better for my children. <laughs> and what have you just done? <laughs> you, 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 you've, you've taken away their, their incentive to uh, build a business, to work hard, to get dirty even though there's a huge payoff for it, you say, I want my kids to have something better. I want them to have it easier. You know, so when you ask, you know, can the money really be kept in the family into perpetuity? Um, no, it can't. Well, all right. So this is one of the areas that I was really looking forward to diving into you. I had it planned for later in the, the interview, but let's get into it right now. Um, so I'm a parent. I've got two daughters, uh, teenage daughters. Um, One's about to turn 20. Uh, and I think the from our stats, a, a large chunk of the people who watch these videos here at Wealthy On uh, mm -hmm. are people who have families. And I think a, a big driver, uh, in fact, I just did an informal survey on this on Twitter, 
um, a big driver of, of their desire to build wealth is to be good providers for their families. Right? Yeah. Very natural. Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. it's, it, it, you know, you, I, I have three kids, five grandkids, one wife, and uh, it's, it's, it all works out pretty well. Um, but look, Warren Buffett really had a good quote on this about how much you should give your children. He says, give them enough so that they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. They can do nothing. I love that quote. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, you, so you, you don't want to uh, abandon the kids, but we read about these stories about the, the kids who get uh, a sense of privilege saying, well, you know, I was born on second base and I deserve to be here. You know, it's well, yeah, we, we call it born on third and thought you hit a triple, right? Okay, right. Or, or <laughs> even more generous on third and thought you yeah. hit a triple. But, but what, what, what I love about this, uh, and I'd love just to have you, you're, you're running it, but, but your research does show that self made wealth generally tends to get depleted by the next generation. And it's not necessarily, and please contradict me if I'm wrong, um, I'm, I'm just diving into this because I've, I've said this a lot and I want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Um, it's not that their kids are necessarily the rich kids of Instagram, you know, who are just spoiled spendthrifts. Um, it's oftentimes a lot of what you just described, which is the, the successful entrepreneur who had to be, you know, really scrappy and, and just clawing their way up adversity and building their network of dry cleaners or their plumbing company mm -hmm. or whatever, or their, their bolt semen distributorship. <laughs> um, uh, you know, once they have kids, they, they say, as a caring parent, you know, naturally might say is, I had it really rough. I don't want you to have it as rough as me. I remember your books that they guide kids to go into sort of safe uh, industries like, you know, become a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant mm -hmm. or whatever. And um, what, what they do is uh, they deprive their kids unwittingly in most cases um, of building the musculature to be scrappy and to, to build their way up from adversity and to, to really, you know, have to belt tighten, you know, with money and, and, and be very frugal and whatnot. And so what happens is, is a lot of these kids just, just naturally just sort of burn through the money they inherit from their parents over time. Um, and it's because they haven't developed that musculature of financial scrappiness. Am I describing this correctly? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you really are. It's um, look, um, being hungry is good. It, it, it really uh, gets the juices flowing and you'd say, I, what can I do to make a living? You know, I've taught over 10,000 students at the university and I would, my advice to them would be, yeah, follow your dreams, but don't forget to make a living, you know? So it's great to, to have a, a job or, or, or have a career that doesn't pay anything, but how are you going to live? You know, which brings us to another issue as to, um, you know, the cost of education um, and the student debt that is brought on and the, you know, the, the burdens right out of the gate students have, you know, which makes it less likely they're going to be able to uh, create more wealth. And so what they might be doing is instead of thinking about, you know, paying down, well, <laughs> avoid debt initially, <laughs> that's, uh, that's number one. So wouldn't that be great? Get your parents and grandparents to pay for your education. Well, you don't have any skin in the game. If that's the case, there has to be skin in the game where you say, yeah, I have to be able to make a living doing this. And I have to like what I'm doing. You know, I know a lot of students who hated the majors they selected, but they said, this is what my parents said I had to do. You know, when you talk about the safe occupations like attorneys and uh, physicians, I recently had a procedure and my anesthesiologist uh, comes into the room and because he has my chart and he says, oh, you wrote the millionaire next door. I said, yeah, he goes, you got to talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I make a lot of money, but she spends a lot of money. She spends it, yeah. And the last thing I, that's the last conversation I remembered with him, then I was asleep. <laughs> well, at least he sounds like he was good at his job. Yeah, exactly. He, uh, I wouldn't have known if I didn't wake up. <laughs> but anyway, 
All right. Um, so, well, so, you know, so in, in, in your book here, um, you know, you have these sort of seven key factors for, for becoming a prodigious accumulator of wealth. Um, we've talked about a couple of them. So uh, I'm going through them in, in no real order here. But um, one of them was they believe that financial independence is more important than displaying high social status. So that's what we talked about earlier, right, is they don't get distracted by the marketing engine. They don't feel that they have to accumulate the trappings of wealth, the expensive car, the big McMansion to, to showcase their wealth, right? So we talked about that. Um, interestingly, their adult children are more economically self-sufficient, um, but it sounds like uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they still have the uh, financial um, wealth building uh, prowess that their parents did. And feel free to, to um, true. No, true, clarify true. that at all. But but I want to get next to, I think what I took away is sort of the biggest one of these seven from your book, which was they live well below their means. Um, yeah. So if you can, if you can dive into that, because that really did seem to be sort of a, a universal success element there. And um, uh, if you can talk about, are, are they doing that because uh, they're looking at the numbers and just saying, look, I, to, to have more money tomorrow, I need to save more money today? Or are they also, is there an element there of just, hey, a life of less trappings is just a more fulfilling life? Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Um, look, one of my Buddhist friends says, to have true wealth, you must give up everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you yeah, know, there's a point to that. But anyway, we don't have to be so extreme in, in this case. Um, let's look at the uh, prodigious accumulators and the under accumulators and how they would view this. The, um, you know, in fact, we have this uh, illustration of Dr. North and Dr. South. Dr. North, they both are physicians who make, uh, you know, a large amount of money but Dr. North has a significantly greater net worth than Dr. South. Now, what is the difference between the two? They're both highly trained and educated, but when it comes to buying a car, for example, Dr. North says, yeah, I like luxury cars, but I'll buy a five-year-old Mercedes that's fully, well, not fully depreciated, but highly depreciated. Got a good chunk of it, yeah. Yeah, and I'll let somebody give me the gift of early depreciation. Okay, so he still has a luxury car that you can bring into a supermarket parking lot and not get all bent out of shape when you get dinged by a shopping cart, right? Dr. South, on the other hand, like every other year or every year, takes time off from his practice and shops around for the next luxury car because he loves that new car smell and he just loves to have something new. Well, somebody who's going to buy his used car is going to appreciate the get the depreciation, right? But what he is doing is being a, a spendthrift, you know, thinking that having this luxury is so well, I deserve it because I see death and dying on a daily basis. And therefore I'm going to just spend, spend, spend. Well, living below your means is really critical. And that's how you, you know, when you become this uh, prodigious accumulator, it's not because you know you're you're neurotic about it. You're saying, wait a minute, I need a car. I like good cars. A five-year-old Mercedes is perfectly fine. I used to drive a Mercedes. I drive a Subaru now and I love it. It's great in the snow. <laughs> I could put my chainsaw on the back. You know, you don't do that with a Mercedes. I could put my fishing tackle in the back of the Subaru. You know, you could put a dead fish in the Subaru. <laughs> But my point put is, that, put that trout above you. Yeah. Well, yeah. See, I have a car that I want to have that's reliable, but one that I can live with, you know, and 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 work, you know, do what I have to do, you know, from firewood to chainsaws to fishing gear. Um, it's great. Okay. Same thing with clothes off the rack. You know, well, you can buy good clothes off the rack. You don't have to have custom suits. You know. Uh, I, I taught a seminar in uh, Taiwan for over nine summers and I'd get custom suits there. And my students would tell me, you know, you can even get a better deal in Hong Kong. <laughs> so my point, you know, and that's where they go. The Taiwanese go to Hong Kong for their suits. Not anymore, I suspect, uh, with the current disruption. But my point is, there are so many ways of acting frugally without being cheap about it. You know, a Subaru is a fine car. You know, clothes off the rack from Macy's are fine. There's a lot of fine things. 
you know, it's when we get into this mindset, I need the very best, the biggest, the most expensive. My friends in law enforcement say, you know, when they hear this mantra of, I say, I want to live in the big house with a big car and the big lawn and everything else. You know, when the criminal element wants to rob somebody, burglarize somebody, do you go to some ordinary house with some ordinary car? Man, what money could they have? Right, right, or right, you, right. Or do you target the one that says, look at me, I have all this bling. You know, it's, um, we bring it on ourselves. And so it's a matter of safety of just living this modest lifestyle. But secondly, you say, look, money is just a result of my activity. Money wasn't my goal in the first place. I mean, yeah, I want to make a living, but I want to be the best provider of, you know, rental services. I want to be the best, you know, franchise owner in fast foods. I want to do this in a way that people would gladly bring their money and buy my product. You know, it's the value proposition, right? And this is what every one of these millionaires understands, the value proposition. What can I offer? What can I create? How can I deliver something of value that somebody wants to give their money for? Now, when you make money your singular goal, you'll never have enough. <laughs> That's such a great point, Bill. As you said, when you make money your goal, you'll never have enough. And, and that's what I think is really at the heart of your book, which is these prodigious accumulators of wealth. They have a really clear why. In other words, they know exactly why they are living beneath their means, what they are building towards, right? So for them, it's not just about putting more and more money in there because that is, to your point, it's sort of a never ending game. Um, and you don't necessarily, you know, get to a point where you're enjoying the benefits of that if you haven't already in your mindset why you're doing this. Uh, the other thing you mentioned is that um, these prodigious accumulators of wealth, uh, that they know, and this is one of your tenets uh, from your book, um, but that they are, are very clear on the value that they are bringing. Um, uh, you call this, uh, they chose the right occupation, right? They're very clear on what they're going to lean into to create value that other people are going to pay them for, right? To bring in their income. And then they're going to co combine that with the frugality uh, to be able to put that money away again towards a goal, not just to put money in the bank, uh, you know, to create an infinite amount of money, but to enable the type of life they want to have, to be in control of their time, as you said earlier, to take care of their kids, whatever it is, but they're very clear on that why. Did I summarize this correctly? Absolutely. Money is a byproduct. You know, this is right out of uh, Earl Nightingale's Strangest Secret. Do you remember that essay? I think it was 1955 or 1957, but he made it into a short book, but he also has an audio about the strangest secret is you must be a giver before you can get, you know, people say, I want, I just want to get, well, no, you have to give something of value and then the money comes as the reward. He uses the, uh, the metaphor about the person who says to the wood burning stove, give me heat. Then I will give you wood. <laughs> you know? It's as simple as that. And, and when students hear that, they say, wow, that's how it really works. I must stoke the flame and then the heat comes. I must add value to my customer base. Then the money comes to me because of what I do. Right. And, and, and again, going back to mindset, we have this culture that is such a fake it till you make it culture, yeah. right? Look like you're a success, then the success will follow. Um, and it's completely enabled both by social media that we've already talked about. Mm -hmm but also by the financial industry, right? By the time you turn, the moment you turn 18, I mean, the credit card companies, the banks, they, they cannot fall over themselves fast enough to lend you money, right? And encourage you to spend it on the stuff that makes you feel good. Take the big trip, you know, buy the big car, uh, et cetera. Um, so the reason why I keep underscoring this mindset is, is to really be successful here, you really have to buck the societal herd. Is that really what it comes down to? Yeah, you know, this... Um read recently in the Wall Street Journal that some very wealthy people are putting up their portfolios as collateral to get these one or 2% loans at their bank. So they're taking on a lot of debt, but they have the collateral now with their, with their portfolio. 
But if their portfolio sinks in value and they still have this debt to pay off, they may find themselves in a very squeezed uh, position. You know, one of the things looking at the um, uh, American housing surveys and IRS data, uh, the statistics of income bulletin, one of the things we know is that at the time, and, and estate tax returns, at the time of death, most millionaires have a very modest amount of debt. Um, you know, they're not overextended. Because they understand, a, um, in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, um, chapter 22, verse 7, the borrower is a slave to the lender. 2,500 years ago, when that was written, we knew still, that. Yeah, <laughs> it's still true today. Every bank wants to give you a loan. Well, not every bank wants to, but you know they they make their money by lending out money, of course. And if you fall into the trap of saying I'm going to expand my lifestyle because I can get more and more loans to support that lifestyle, in 1985. The Nobel laureate in economics, Franco Medigliani, won his prize for the life cycle of money. And in, in effect, what his life cycle of money is, when you're young, you work for money. And when you're old, money works for you. Now, I don't know if that deserves a Nobel Prize, but it certainly is the way I've lived. I've lived in, you know, knowing... That's the way it works with the time value of money. If when you're young, you can make the money, create this, what we call self-imposed economic scarcity. That's right between your ears. Self-imposed economic scarcity. Say, if I make 100,000 a year, I'm going to force myself to live on 80,000. If I make a million a year, I'll force myself to live on 800,000. <laughs> okay. No matter what it is. If you can consistently save 20% or more and invest across a diverse uh, set of assets, you will become the millionaire and the multimillionaire. There's no question about that. All right, Bill. Now we're getting to the main heart of why I was so excited to have you on here today. So uh, everything that you're talking about here is about a mindset. Right? It's about a way to look at life and to orient your life around it to be better off tomorrow than you are today. But these tenets of wealth that you're talking about and this mindset around it, they are not taught in our educational system. And you know this well because you know, you've know you spent a lot of your career in education. So you know, I look at this and it, it's just so frustrating to me because so many of the tenants we're talking about, you know, as you've said, they are timeless. Uh, if you look at the data, it's pretty clear you know, that these are the success factors. And yet school, which the number one reason why we all go to school and get an education is because we think it's going to set us up to succeed, to hit our life goals. Uh, it, it completely fails us in teaching us these tenets and this mindset. And to me, that's just so incredibly frustrating and just, just feels so wrong. I, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the topic? Yeah. <laughs> are you as yeah. enraged as, as, as I am? I'm oh, sure I am. Are. Um, well, you know, I, I have direct control. Well, I, I say direct control. I have regular contact with my five grandchildren who age from age 10 to 15. And I introduce these concepts to them. And I think so far, so good. You know, they don't hang out at the, the shopping centers. You know, I bring them to the Adirondack Mountains a lot, saying, you know, we're, we're going to enjoy nature. And these are the kind of things that I want them to value, not the fact that you have to buy something or not about things. Okay. Look, um, it, and the, maybe the reason that I have this perspective, um, you know, my father died when I when he was 38 and I was five years old and I saw how my mother, you know, struggled to, to keep a family together. And she did. And um, my father had a 10th grade education. My mother was a high school graduate. But one of the things my mother told me, Bill, stay in school. I took her literally, <laughs> you know, right through the PhD program and then become a professor. And uh, it, it was great. But that one piece of advice of saying stay in school. So in this case, it paid off. That's, that's for sure. 
you know, can I use the educational skills, you know, the statistics and the computer applications uh, and research methods, um, you know, to further my career. But quite frankly, um, you know, not, not to put a, a specific date on this uh, particular episode, but in today's Wall Street Journal, there's an interesting study about um, how Blacks in college education have fallen behind because, you know, you, they looked at two 10-year periods and whites, the more education, the better off they are. But with the Blacks over these past 10 years, the explanation is, well, they didn't have, you know, a parent or a grandparent to pay for their education. And very often they went into one of these, uh, in these for-profit schools that gave them less than a useful education. And they ended up with a lot of debt behind the eight ball, their net worth is down. So yeah, our education system really needs a lot of modification. You know, I'm, I've always been of the, the mindset teaching somebody how to fish instead of giving them a fish, <laughs> okay? And if we can teach them how to build a career, you know, not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's going to be an attorney, but everybody can do something. And, and if you take that mindset of self-imposed economic scarcity, saying I am going to consistently live on 80% or less of what I make and save and invest across a diverse set of assets, man, you got it licked. It's the answers are right there in the book. If anybody will just pay attention and say, but, but you know what, Adam, here's, here's the real problem. It, and it is a problem. And I attribute this to Benjamin Franklin from an essay in 1758. The essay was titled the way to wealth. It's 3,500 words. You can Google it and, you know, get a free copy but he gives the precepts of you know, how to build wealth, you know, this frugality, prudence, industriousness, and, and, and plus what we'll get to with richer than a millionaire in a second. But the concluding paragraph of his essay said, okay, after all of this wisdom has been imparted to the townspeople, they agreed with it and then practiced the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we haven't changed very much huh? yeah behavior modification is the key but it's hard to change isn't it we, we get into our cultural ways of spend, earn and spend well and that's why i'm trying to hammer this point home here that it's all about mindset you know there's a, a fascinating relatively recent field of behavioral economics that sprung up around this because you would think we would make exceptionally rational decisions around money because it's so quantifiable, but instead we make horribly irrational decisions around it because we're human animals, right? We're emotional thinkers. Um, and, uh, and so anyways, uh, you know, to, to, to buck uh, the imperfections in our programming, we really have to get the narrative right. We have to get the story right. We have to get our mindset right. And it's so remains such a, a frustration and point of, um, you know, of real kind of ire for me that our education system is just not teaching this and setting so many people up for permanent disappointment and frustration when we have the answers available to us. All right, look, Bill, I, I wanna get to talking about um, your later book, Richer Than a Millionaire, uh, in, in just a second here. As I wrap up our discussion on Millionaire Next Door, for the folks that haven't read it, I just wanna dial through the seven key factors uh, for building wealth that you outline in that book. And we'll just uh, put them up on the screen here so that for the folks that are taking notes, these are kind of the crib notes of Millionaire Next Door. Factor number one is they live well below their means. Uh, factor number two is they allocate their time, energy, and money efficiently in ways conducive to building wealth. Number three, they believe that financial independence is more important than displaying high social status. Number four, their parents did not provide economic outpatient care. They didn't spoil their kids. Uh, number five, their adult children are economically self-sufficient. Uh, we mentioned that earlier, they're self-sufficient. Uh, they may not be as good accumulators of wealth as their parents, but the kids generally kind of tend to go, come out okay for that generation. Uh, number six is they are proficient in targeting market opportunities. They find areas in the market uh, where there are imperfections and they then step in to better serve those, uh, that part of the market. And that's how they, you know, they, they, they uh, 
create a value that then demands a premium and an income. And then number seven is they choose the right occupation. They know themselves well, they develop a good understanding uh, so that they can play to their strengths as they go about their wealth building journey. Uh, so those are the top seven factors from the book. Um, Bill, quickly, anything you want to say about them before yeah. we move on? Um, they're timeless. They, they, I mean, they really are. Um, look, uh, you, you could never, I've always said you can never get enough education. And this is just one element of it in this book. You know, there's uh, other books I could recommend too. Like, you know what? Yeah, I like A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton McHale, the Princeton professor. It's like in its 12th edition now. You know, he doesn't have an ax to grind, but he just talks about the life cycle of money and how to plan your financial life. It's, uh, it's, uh, there, there's some good wisdom in there. Okay. All right, well, well, look, so let's move on now on? to, uh, yeah. yeah, so richer than a millionaire, <laughs> right there, a pathway to true prosperity. Um, so, uh, you know, when you, we, so Professor Stanley, sadly, you know, you mentioned he had been one of your teachers, he, he passed away. So mm -hmm. you wrote this next book in 2017. It is much more mindset oriented. Um, what, what made you choose this as the sequel to the previous yeah. Yeah, uh, Rich Van Ness, um, he's about 10 years older than I, and he's an ex-Marine. And he's, we always talk about the idea of mission orientation. You know, what do we have to do to solve a problem? And he says, you know, look, we've had thousands of students that we taught, and many of them are like ships without rudders on the high seas of life. <laughs> and he said, you know, yeah we have to teach things like, you know, management and marketing and finance. But one of the things the students are not getting is personal finance by and large. And so we specifically looked at the, this new research as well, one, let's do another survey, but two, let's look at it from values perspective and try to do this, you know, I don't know, the social worker approach of look, here's my problem. What would you recommend professors? You know, so we tried to have it hands-on and direct students, especially, into thinking about a wealth mindset, you know, because they're starting at ground zero for the most part. What do they have to do to build their wealth over time? And that, that was the motivation for the book. But another motivation, you know, for, it, it, and, and this really shaped my life as well, you know, when my mother died, uh, I inherited, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I inherited my quadriplegic brother and I vowed to keep him out of a uh, nursing home, my wife and I did. And uh, for the next 20 years of his life, you know, we bought him a house, you know, I was the weekend date every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And because it's hard to get healthcare aids, <laughs> that's one thing. But here I am, you know, a bon vivant, New York Times bestseller, PhD, dealing with a guy who can't even scratch his nose. And, you know, you, you look at this and say, wait a minute, you know, giving your time is a charitable aspect. And I know it's the right thing to do. Well, with this idea of, with Benjamin Franklin in that Way to Wealth essay, he says, being industrious, frugal, focused, you know, enduring pain to, to achieve your goals, he says it's all blasted without a blessing from heaven and therefore ask that blessing humbly and be charitable to those who are in need of your abilities and your money. Well, let's test this. How are people reacting with their money? You know, if they're not spending it on themselves and they know it's a bad idea to give it to their children because they're going to create an artificial lifestyle and you don't want to die with a huge estate tax. What do you do? Maybe you become charitable. You know, Buffett certainly has taken that pledge and a number of other very wealthy people have publicly taken that pledge, right? Okay, so what about this idea of charity in terms of, you know, how much time you donate to a charity and how much money you donate to the charity? Well, coupled with another construct from the psychology literature, um, Professor Ed Diener, who just died earlier this year, uh, a psychology professor created something called the subjective well-being 
um, framework, SWB. And he did this with a seven point scale, five statements that you uh, respond to and you add up the uh, data points. And if you score really low, you tend to be unhappy with your life. And if you score high, you tend to be well adjusted. Well, <laughs> what would you rather be disgruntled or well adjusted? I think anybody would say, yeah, I want to be well adjusted, right? Okay, so what do you have to do? What are the correlates of those who are well adjusted? What we found in our research, whether you're a near millionaire or over the millionaire status, when we did the study, there's a parallel on each of them. Those who are charitable are more well adjusted. Those who are um, uh, practicers practicing the golden rule, doing to others as you would have them do unto you, are more well adjusted. Those who are integrated in society, in general, they belong to you know social organizations, churches, and synagogues, and social groups, you know, and community groups like Rotary, are more well adjusted. So, what do we have here? We have about 15% of the very wealthy, according to our survey research, 15% who are maladjusted. <laughs> you know, they can't have enough money. But those, and in fact, it's on page 26 of Richer Than a Millionaire, that we have this graph that shows, well, how much is enough? And it tends to bottom out at about $5 million, saying no matter what I have, you know, I always need more, but it tends to decay nicely and bottom out at about $5 million is a, a net worth that you say, I, I do have enough in terms of actual money, okay? And still, that's a lot of money. That puts you like in the top 2% of the net worth distribution in America, okay? So the idea here in Richer Than a Millionaire is that one, we want to train students, especially as I, you know, evaluate where you stand, you know, what are your career goals? Knowing that there is an upper limit of what you should shoot for, instead of saying, I'm going to just get as much money as I possibly can, you know, 5 million, okay, that's, that's one goal. But also make them realize there are so many different ways of making money, much like the way we did it in Millionaire Next Door, that you don't have to be one of those professionals. You don't even have to go to college for that matter. There are so many ways of making money that are, well, to meet your material goals. And then when you realize I can do so many better things with my money and be well adjusted at the same time and not being anxious about the future, uh, that's what we mean by being richer than a millionaire. Because the million dollars is just a starting point. But to truly be rich, just as Benjamin Franklin said, you must be charitable to others. So I love where you're going this, Bill, which is really that the money in the bank really is just a means to an end. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's really about living, you know, a fulfilling life in a way that, uh, you know, makes you content, fulfills you, um, you know, uh, you've got socially rewarding um, relationships, et cetera. And, and, you know, what's great about those is, is you can apply those at any point in life, right? So in other words, uh, as you are on your journey uh, towards your, your wealth building goals, you know, those are things that you can bake into your everyday life, right? A lot of them don't even cost money, obviously, right? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, by the time you, you hit your financial goals, well, you're already sort of well experienced in you know developing these sort of aspects of living a truly wealthy life uh, you're not having to build those muscles from scratch once you hit some sort of arbitrary financial deadline uh, and of course if you never hit the financial deadline you're still living a rich life in fact for a lot of people uh, th their chosen profession that's the best fit for them um, you know it, it might not put them into that millionaire uh, quotient um, but if they are living a life of meaning uh, and you know, motivated and fulfilled when they get up in the morning um, and happy when they go to bed at the end of the day, then they're already winning life, right? Do, do you see things similarly? Yeah, especially. So, you know, you drive your used Subaru, you know, you live in a modest house and you say, you know, I'm having a good time. My bills are getting paid. You know, we've put two, that number is so artificial as to how much money you think you need. If you just define a lifestyle that says, how can I live with myself? 
<laughs> in the sense of, am I really integrated in society? Am I really being charitable enough? Am I really helping others and contributing to a better life? You know, my, my friends uh, in the Jewish uh, religion, they, they have this phrase or this word, two words, uh, tikkun olam, heal the world. And they're brought up, especially in, in the Hebrew school, to say, your mission is to be a, a contributor to society. You know, it's value oriented. <laughs> I applaud that. There's no question. And of course, that's right out of uh, Isaiah in the Old Testament. You know, Isaiah 58, give your coat to those who have no coat. Feed the hungry. You know, give water to the thirsty. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's there. And in Matthew 25 in Christianity, it's the same thing. You know, that which you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. You know, you don't have to look at it from a religious perspective. You can look at it from a psychological perspective, too, saying being integrated and helping others is really the key to overall life satisfaction. Well, Bill, I'm sure you've seen the, the work when they interview centurions and they ask them, you know, these are people that have lived beyond 100 years, uh, and they ask them, look, what, what really matters about life? And invariably, they all come down to the quality of their social relationships. Uh, in certain cases, uh, you know, some of the work they were able to do that they found meaningful and they feel like they're leaving a better legacy behind. Uh, they never talk about the money. They never talk about the physical trappings of wealth. It's really all about kind of the, the same type of intangibles that you talk about in, in your book. Um, so as we wrap things up here, I, I want to point out one sort of delicious irony to all of your work, which is I, I appreciate it so much and I recommend it so widely because it is so empirically driven, as we talked about earlier. But when it really comes down to it, you know, the insights of the book, the key value of the book really is all about a change in mindset, right? It, it's really about, a, a, you know, the soft skills of looking at the world differently than the herd and then having the discipline and the commitment to apply that in your own life. So for viewers, you know, I encourage you, this is your opportunity. If you truly want your tomorrow to be better than today, is to apply the principles from, from Bill's work uh, in both books, you know, in, in your life and, and specifically in that of your children, if you've got a family. Um, you know, as we, we've learned from his work, um, you, you, you want to teach them this mindset. Um, you don't want to spoon feed them. You don't want to, you know, that you, you need to let them struggle. You don't want to provide that economic outpatient care. They've got to, you know, get out there and learn the lessons themselves. Um, but of course, you want to be there to support them emotionally along the way and step in at certain times where, where you can help. Um, all right. Well, uh, Bill, as, as we wrap up here, just two last questions for you. Uh, the first is just to get your opinion on something that I talk a lot about every week on this program. Um, here's my thought, which is um, I, I think it is getting harder for people to build wealth, even following the tenets that you lay out here. And that's for reasons, uh, you know, I think largely due in many cases to uh, decisions that are being made at the government level, whether it's Federal Reserve policy, uh, you know, increasing the money flow, um, you know, stimulus packages. Um, There's a whole host of things that we talk about here, but 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 the outshot of it is is that uh, the cost of ri the cost of living is rising much faster and has been for decades now than real wages for the vast majority of people, uh, and so it, you have to run faster and faster uh, to make the same amount of progress. And uh, wealth inequality has really just exploded in this country, and the spoils are going to fewer and fewer people at a faster and faster rate, while more and more people are being left behind. So um, this is something we talk about in this program. I don't want to rat hole with you on, on you know, specific policy type issues here. But is this a concern that you share as well? Many young people are right behind the eight ball as soon as they get out of college with student debt. And... Um, I don't know, one solution, the government says, let's forgive, let's do forbearance on student debt. And the Wall Street Journal says forever. <laughs> yeah, maybe, probably, at least as long as the current administration has its way. No, it, it, it is value-oriented. And we've lost our way with a lot of uh, misguided ideas about what makes a good life. Well, to your point, Bill, about it being, you know, values oriented. So, you know, these poor kids, not only are they graduating with, uh, on average, with a tremendous amount of, of school debt um, and perhaps other kinds of debt too, credit card, et cetera, um, but uh, 
they aren't getting any return on savings in a bank. Um, and so we're teaching you know, a generation of, of, of people that saving is for losers, right? I mean, talk about sort of a toxic lesson to be telling people that's so counter to the key tenets of wealth building, right? But uh, you know, that's the lesson that society is actively telling them right now. And you know, these poor kids, you know, be, because of that, because it's so much harder for them to, to amass capital, they're developing a speculator's mindset, right? Which is that, well, if I have any money, I guess I got to throw that into the newest hot cryptocurrency or the, the hot meme stock so that I have a prayer of potentially affording a house, which now costs many more multiples of an annual income as it did for my parents' generation, right? So, um, you know, these poor kids were just, we're, we're uh, you know, it, it, our, our analogy of being born on uh, third and feeling like you hit a triple, you know, I think these kids are sitting there in the, uh, in the dugout and they feel like they've already, you know, got uh, uh, two strikes uh, on them when they're stepping up to, to swing for the first time. Do you think the same thing? Well, you know, here's, here, here's the irony. Again, the millionaire next door came out in 1996. And I know some of the critics have said, well, it's so preachy. They're telling us what to do. Well, you know, 20 uh, something years later, the lessons still are there. And those who follow those lessons do create the wealth. And those who become charitable even become wealthier. All right. So we know what the answer is. Are people willing to embrace the answer? I feel like Benjamin Franklin all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that gives a real advantage to the folks watching this video, Bill. Uh, they can see the timelessness of the messages of Franklin, of you and Dr. Stanley's work, and they can be amongst the conscientious minority to proactively apply these principles in their own lives in bettering their own futures. So in wrapping things up, Bill, if folks want to learn more about you and your work and follow it, where should they go? Uh, the one good place is uh, richerthanamillionaire.com. That's all one word, richerthanamillionaire.com. Um, and also the books are readily available at Amazon. I mean, especially during the pandemic, that was a godsend to, uh, to have the books at Amazon for sure. But, um, and you know, look, Millionaire Next Door takes care of itself. It, it just is a perennial seller. It's um uh, the royalties keep coming in. It's, it's great. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, but richer than a millionaire, the newer uh, output here, um, Rich Van S and I purposely priced it so that any student could buy this or anybody could buy it. $7.99 for the paperback and $3.99 for Kindle. My point is, we bent over backwards to say, let's get the word out because, you know, we're at the stage and I, I, I think, you know, when you're 70 something, you know, you can say, you know, I don't have to prove anything anymore. I just want to share my lessons that I've learned through my life. And uh, having a Marine on my side saying, Bill, we got to get this darn thing done. <laughs> that was pretty helpful. <laughs> Well, what I love about this, Bill, is you're living your values here. Um, you, know, you talked about uh, charity being a key element of living a rich life. You know, here at pricing the book at uh, was it seven ninety nine for the paperback and three ninety nine for the Kindle. And you're practically giving it away, so you're, you're you're practicing charity and getting these insights out into the world. Um, all right, Bill. Well, look, as we wrap up here, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, we ran long. I appreciate you staying long with us. Uh, could have gone for another hour, uh, but got to get you back to your, your busy life. But, but really just want to thank you for the huge impact that your work has had on me, but obviously on millions of people around the world. I've certainly heard from many of them uh, as folks knew you were coming on the program here. Thank you for the difference you've made in the wor world and the difference your work continues to make. And hopefully we can have you back on the pro program again soon. But I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to have you on. Adam, thank you. Be well. We hope you've enjoyed this excellent discussion with co-author of The Millionaire Next Door, Dr. William Danko. Now, the big question is, how exactly will you apply his scientifically derived wealth building principles into your own life? You know, my personal opinion is that building wealth is very similar to building health. A knowledgeable, supportive, and motivating coach helps most people make a lot more progress than they'd make on their own. So if you're really serious about building sustainable wealth, get a good financial advisor who understands Bill's research to be your coach. If you've already got a good one, great, stick with them. 
Send them Bill's books and ask them to sit down with you to develop an action plan around him. But if you don't already have a solid coach like this in place, consider scheduling a no commitment, no strings attached consultation with the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion. These are the same experts who join me on this program every week. Just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. It only takes you a couple of seconds to do so. And it could just change the trajectory of your financial future. Uh, but hey, before you go, please don't forget to take a quick second and click the subscribe button below if you haven't already, as, long, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes you a second and it really does help us out as the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts we can attract onto this program in the future. Okay, many thanks for subscribing folks and thanks for watching.